First of all, let me say thank you very much for joining us on Bloomberg TV. Let me just start off by asking you, can you talk us through why you think that in 10 to 15 years, the consumers of the BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India and China, will be as big as the United States, even though some might say they're really quite poor countries still? Well, they are, they are four different countries, but if, if you look at what's going on in the four of them, uh, particularly the big C, uh, the consumers are starting to become more and more important uh, in their own uh, rights, and certainly if you aggregate them. Uh, the, for example, currently the Chinese consumption uh, is growing probably between 15 to 20 percent in U.S. dollar terms. Uh, which would be the equivalent to the U.S. consumer growing by about 3 to 4 percent. Uh, if you ag aggregate uh, the level of uh, the four countries that make up the acronym, uh, the, the current level of consumption is about $4 trillion. Uh, if they all continue to grow at double-digit rates, uh, even being conservative, therefore, uh, that would have them growing by over $500 billion a year. It's probably more like 15 to 20 percent. So by the middle of the decade, uh, these four countries alone will be seeing their aggregate dollar consumption rise by more than a trillion dollars. So it's not difficult if they carry on at that rate for them to become bigger than the U.S. Jim, how much of this pre is predicated on weak U.S. consumer spending? You mentioned there, 3 to 4 percent a year. How long would that go on for? Is this really a trend now, weak U.S. consumers? Well, I think in, in the near term, uh, it might actually turn out to be the case that the U.S. consumer does a tiny bit better, uh, given the amount of stimulus and, and some evidence, uh, particularly following the election uncertainties, um, that the U.S. economy is doing a bit better. But the fact of the matter is, over the next uh, five years and maybe longer, the U.S. faces the reality that the consumer is still about 70 percent of its own GDP. And you've got to think in this post-bubble world that it's going to uh, come down to something closer to 65%. So it's unlikely that the U.S. consumer itself will grow so much uh, in, the, in this decade as it's done over the past three. We've heard a lot about the European debt crisis as well. What's your take on the European consumer? Well, I think you have to be careful when looking at the European situation. Superficially, because of the severity of this crisis, which of course for some of the European countries, particularly Club Med and, and Ireland, uh, especially the smaller Club Med countries, it is severe. Uh, but in terms of the consumer issue, we, we can't uh, ignore the fact that Germany, uh, an economy which is about a third of the euro area, so individually the one that is easily the most important, amazingly appears to be seeing its consumers showing signs of life finally. Uh, 20 years on from unification. So it's not all bleak in a European context, but if you put Germany as the strongest together with uh, the severe challenges facing the likes of Greece, Portugal, Spain, Ireland, the aggregate European consumer picture doesn't look fantastic either. Let's think about Chinese consumers, clearly a very key part of your assessment. Now, the Chinese, you predict, will be able to turn around its consumption trend in the next 10 to 15 years, reversing the decline of consumption to GDP ratio, which has fallen dramatically over the last 15 years. Can they do that? Aren't there a lot of challenges on reasons why the Chinese save? I mean, of course, there are lots of challenges, but Linda, as you, you probably just as aware as I am, so, some of this is a little bit deceptive. What, one of the reasons why the consumers uh, declined as a share of overall GDP is actually purely because other parts of GDP have risen so much, uh, particularly uh, capex and investment, uh, and especially up until the global crisis, uh, also exports. So, to some extent, just by those two sets as growing less, uh, it would be easy for the consumer staying at its uh, old growth rate to become a bigger share. And I don't think people should lose sight of that very important basic fact. On top of that, uh, because of the Chinese desire to maintain overall GDP growth to a, a reasonable rate, the Chinese policymaking machine is highly focused in its fifth year plan on trying to further boost consumption. And I think we'll see uh, uh, an ongoing variety of measures to try and uh, encourage that, including uh, measures to support wage growth at the bottom, uh, 
uh, as part of an overall package to narrow income differentials, further measures uh, to support urbanizing uh, citizens and the development of social security and, and actual methods to discourage uh, savings from some of the uh, areas that have saved so much the past few years. So I think you've got a lot of uh, things in, in chain already that are just going to continue and, and become more and more important as the decade progresses. Oh, you know, the, Jim, the next follow-up question then, which is if the Chinese consumer is growing well, biggest auto market in the world, as you rightly say, how much can Western companies actually benefit from it? Well, I think for, for Western companies um, across a whole variety of different industries, you know, they've got to be in there today. Uh, and I think one has to be careful. You, you can't just look at the kind of numbers we produce and think it's a very easy thing to benefit from. I think for those companies that have very strong uh, product brand, uh, particularly at the higher net worth end, it is an incredible opportunity. Louis Vuitton in the luxury goods space, for example, epitomize it. Um, in the auto sector, you can see what I mean by being careful. I think more and more, it is really the foreign producers with a, which have a really strong brand. So BMW and Mercedes seem to be doing particularly well. Lower down the value added chain, I think it's trickier, which is partly why the, the Japanese auto producers don't seem to be doing quite so well. Mm. Uh, if you go into the broader array of consumer uh, 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 eating or, or goods in terms of supermarket type stuff, there you've got to really be a, 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 an early player with emphasis on volume because that is probably a sector where the Chinese can find it easier to compete than uh, in the luxury goods space. Let me take you to the N11, the next 11 emerging economies that you're very excited about, because it's not just the brick consumers, is it? It's also no. the N11. Can you just kind of talk us through why you think the N11 have the potential to be a consumption base when in this recession, they actually had some of them pretty bad recessions? Yeah, they did. I think it's, I think it's important, first of all, when one talks about this group of the so-called next 11, you know, within it, there is a lot of diversity. Uh, both in terms of uh, the amount of people in some of them. You've got Indonesia, 250 million people. And at the lower end, you've got the likes of uh, uh, Korea, uh, not much more than 50. Uh, then, of course, uh, you've got incredible different levels of development and wealth. And if you try to project forward, uh, not all the next 11 countries individually stand out as being that big uh, a consumer. There are a few. The ones that we've highlighted are uh, Indonesia, Turkey and Mexico. Uh, and I think those three are uh, not quite uh, as powerful as the BRIC countries going forward, but uh, they, they will be pretty interesting places and important for global consumer companies to focus on as well. So Jim, say we think that your forecasts are taking us down this road of an economic power shift now from the advance to the developing world. What would be your suggested investment strategy in this kind of world? Well, I think it's pretty straightforward. I, I think uh, having exposure either directly or indirectly uh, to the consumers in the BRIC and next 11 country remains the key investment strategy of our lifetime. Whether you do it directly in these countries or through Western multinationals uh, is, is, a, is a second order uh, derivative choice. And that really depends, Linda, on the, on the ongoing price and value offered. There may be times where it's cheaper to go directly into the local markets, or there may be other times, um, such as perhaps in some cases now, where it's better to go via the Western multinationals, especially because they might be taking some of the political and, and selection risk uh, on your behalf. Very finally, as an economist, we always have to look a bit on the downside risks. <laughs> what do you think are the serious downside risks in the BRICS and the N11, but also let's do the US as well, because part of this forecast definitely depends on what happens to yeah. America. You know, I think the, sing the single biggest risk when I look out, uh, not just uh, in terms of looking at a new year with us turning the year soon, but also beyond that and for the decade that we've published this report, I think the single biggest risk is probably some kind of severe protectionist backlash uh, in the West, which we often see 
uh, talk of and political figures threatening it in the West. And I think if we had some grave steps to try and restrict trade, it wouldn't be long before some of the, the vicious circular aspects of that would, would quickly become a negative, which would impede the development uh, of anything to do with the emerging market economies, including their consumers. So <coughs> I think amongst all the risks that there are, one common big one would be that. I think beyond that, Linda, you have to go down to much more individual issues in many different countries. But uh, that would be the, the big one that, that, that I occasionally lie awake at night worrying about.